robots as a platform for education. I'm Tanya Hall and joining me is Paul Berberian, CEO at Sphero. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Tanya. So what does Sphero do? So Sphero makes these really cool robots, these uh, fun programmable robots, and we uh, help kids learn how to code, but not only how to code, how to apply uh, that code to real world uh, situations. So uh, you've heard about STEM and STEAM education. Uh, our products are the perfect tools to teach that in classrooms around the world. Why is it important to add the art component to STEM? So, um, you know, we've been, so STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math, and it, you add the A to make it STEAM for arts. Um, you know, we've been teaching these subjects for centuries. So the, the concept behind STEAM education is, is about applying it uh, to the real world. You, you take these different concepts, these different disciplines, and you apply it. Um, and it's through that application that the lessons really sink in. Uh, you, know, you can teach the Pythagorean theorem on a whiteboard, but when you have to program a robot to drive a triangle, all of a sudden you have to do the math, you have to program it, you have to understand, like it may roll over you know, uneven surfaces, and you have to take that into consideration. On top of it, it's very collaborative. So kids, uh, oftentimes when we were in, with traditional teaching methods, it's a very solitary activity. You're, you're staring at your book and pencil and paper. Um, this is something that's hands-on. They're working together in teams, trying to figure it out. And it just it's just a more profound uh, uh, way to teach subjects in an integrated fashion. And it, it makes a lesson stick. And you know, we like to say when they bring out Sphero, it's the best day at school. Hey, I wish they had Sphero when I was in school. But yeah, how do you help teachers and parents who may be less familiar with coding get up to speed and support a student who is trying to learn these skills? Well, the, the first thing is, is uh, we just encourage them, encourage them to just try because it's so, it's so simple. It's not, it's not complex. I mean, within 15 seconds, you can uh, turn on the robot and, you know, drag a few blocks and all of a sudden you've written your first program. So the very first thing that we do is we, we put a lot of energy into making it very simple for parents and teachers um, to get going. And the, the second thing we do is um, we try to make our robots very friendly. Uh, you know, they're not necessarily you know, scary. They're, they're very, we want them to be simple and elegant so they don't think they're you know, dealing with some sort of expensive or fragile technology. Um, we make our robots very robust. They go through some pretty rigorous tests uh, to make sure that you're not gonna break it. So we try to make it simple, we try to make it safe, we try to make it easy, and most importantly, we, we make it fun. Tell us about some of the robots that are sitting on that table, they're right in front of you. How are they used in learning and including your most recent Kickstarter? So what you see here is uh, five different robots. The, this one is a character that we did um, in 2015 with uh, Walt Disney Company, Star Wars. Um, but they all work with the same uh, programming language, um, which is either uh, JavaScript for the more advanced kids or Scratch for the beginners. And what's really interesting is if you write a program for this little guy, Mini, which is a $50 ping pong ball sized robot, uh, whatever code you write for that will work on this thing, which is obviously a, a, a tank based robot that can carry uh, you know, a, a couple of kilograms of payload and also a Raspberry Pi. But the same code works across everything. Um, but I'll happy to describe them all. So this is a character from BB-8 uh, in the movie. This is our premium product that's sold into schools now. Um, this one uh, is essentially a robot ball uh, that has an LED matrix and a bunch of sensors so the robots can talk to each other. Uh, this little guy is Ollie. This thing's a, a total hoot. It goes 14 miles an hour, virtually indestructible. Um, kind of need a big wide open space for him. Uh, and Rover, which is our, our latest one that will be coming out this fall. It's really a, a robot platform that, that kids can build on top of it, and you don't have to be a kid, you can be an old person uh, like me. Um, but we've, it, it drives incredibly well, incredibly precise, 
so that if you have a cool idea, like you want to use computer vision, you're not fighting the locomotion, you get to build on top of it with whatever things you want, Raspberry Pi, Arduino, Microbit, um, or you can just drive it straight out of the box. What age groups are ideal for using robots and programming tools as learning platforms? Well, we see kids as young, uh, as, young as kindergarten age uh, using it. Obviously, they're not doing sophisticated loops or conditional statements or things of that nature. They're, they're typically interfacing with the robots through color and drawing on a screen. So they'll draw something on the screen and the robot will trace it out. And so they're seeing that cause and effect and they have that agency over that physical device. Um, and so it starts at a very young age and then we think it moves all the way up, you know, to, to adults who are just want to create and make and do something fun. Obviously, uh, as you go up the line here, um, the level of sophistication in, increases and the capabilities of the robot uh, increases as well. Sphero EDU offers thousands of activities for kids, parents, teachers, makers, all of the above to use and bring Sphero to life. What's, why is content important? It's, um, you know, the, the content is really what you're trying to get across. I mean, if you think of a laptop and there's no software on it, it's just a doorstop. Uh, it's essentially the same with the robot. If, it, if you can't do anything with it, then it's just a, a, a cool piece of electronics. Um, so we, our robots have gotten more valuable as these user-generated lessons have been created by teachers as well as students, and, and also the curriculum that we've developed and um, have placed into the into the EDU app as well. So when a teacher has a, a class, they can say, oh, I want to teach fifth grade math today, and I want to teach this concept. Uh, they can search for it, they can find it, and then they can go ahead and do that lesson. And so the robot becomes the, the, uh, uh, the vehicle to deliver the, the message, right? So it's... Uh, we really look at these as, as more as tools than toys. I mean, they are fun like toys, but uh, you know, when you, when you layer all that content around it, they become really powerful teaching aids. So te content is important and robots are becoming teaching aids and robots are doing so much. Um, you and I talked about, we're, we're sending a robot to the moon, to, to Kern pits and to, to habitats, right? So, there's so many areas of life where robots are being included. How do we make sure as robot creators that uh, specifically even content that we aren't influencing uh, any sort of potential bias or negativity uh, that could, you know, lead us astray as a, as a human race? Well, I, hey, that's a, that's a heavy question. Um, I, you know, robots aren't, um, they're, they're machines and they're developed and controlled by humans. And so just like any tool we create, I think we have to be mindful of what we use them for. Um, that you can, you can use them for good or you can use them for evil. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the military drones could be uh, considered weapons of evil if they're full autonomous and have the authority to, you know, cause harm without human intervention. Um, so I think as we just have to be mindful as the creators of this, which, which puts a huge burden on us as the creators of technology. Um, but in our world, our products are pretty straightforward. They're affordable. They're, they're using um, uh, approachable technology. I don't, I don't think are gonna, these are going to be used for anything, um, you know, naughty. Uh, maybe a child's going to do some prank or something with their robot, but hopefully they're not going to do anything um, in that realm of, you know, pure, pure evil. Uh, but it's our, it's our duty, right, as, as humans to make sure we use technology appropriately. Well, I personally support using robots for a little bit of mischief. Um, I'm a big fan of robots, but you know, as a as a CEO of a company who is certainly putting robots in the hands of of all ages, as you pointed out, including children, 
what kind of responsibility do you have as a leader, um, as a CEO, uh, running a company that's, that's moving us forward into this emerging world? Um, I, I look at it as a, um, that we have to be true to our mission, right? And so our mission is to inspire the creators of tomorrow. Obviously, that's a nod to kids, but anyone can be a creator tomorrow. Uh, And and it really ties into this word inspiration, right? We don't look ourselves as um, as the end solution, the ultimate robot. We look at ourselves as a pathway to explore technology, uh, and we look at ourselves as a way to get kids excited about not just becoming consumers of technology, but creators and manipulators of it. Like it's not, it's not a black box. They can see how it works and, and they have agency over it. And not only that, they, they are, are comfortable so that they can come up with ideas that are way more sophisticated than this when they go out into the world and, and, and start building their own companies and robots and great ideas. Uh, so as a CEO, I mean, the first thing that we focus on, of course, is safety, not only safety in terms of the physical products, but also safety in terms of the online data that we collect and the uh, information on how it gets used. Um, you know, we had a choice to either have a, a 100% curated community where every single piece of content submitted into that community gets reviewed by a human before it gets released. Or we had some, or we had a choice of making it completely automated, and then and then remove it by exception. And we chose to take on the burden of approving everything with a human, um, as opposed to automatically publishing. So when a kid publishes something to our community or a teacher, um, it doesn't go live. It goes into a queue, and someone looks at it and determines if the pictures and the images and the words are all appropriate. Um, so first and foremost, it's safety, and the second is is just giving them you know, a really good set of tools so that they don't become frustrated with trying to gain access to it. Because the last thing you want to do is introduce a really cool thing to a child and then immediately then get frustrated with it. And then they feel like they're not capable or worthy and you just crush their spirit. So no crushing spirits, no unsafe robots. Um, it all has to be in the notion of inspiration and, and goodness. Um, it's, it's a delicate balance in the sense of if you make it too safe, then it becomes too restrictive or you get rid of a lot of the fun, right? So, you know, how fast should we make this robot go before it becomes unsafe? Um, there were a lot of discussions is 14 miles an hour too fast for a robot to be running in a house. And, uh, we came up to the answer of no, it's not too, it's not unsafe uh, because it's, it's, it's lightweight, right? So um, there's a lot of fun debates that happen uh, in the early design phases, but ultimately it's all centered around this, this core philosophy. Um, and we always want to go above and beyond whatever the government regulations say. So there's a lot of little, a lot of little details that, you know, are, We've gone to some pretty high extremes where perhaps other companies would have said, nah, it's, it's worth the risk. And we go, nah, it's not really worth the risk. Let's, let's make it work. I imagine you have. What are, what are some of the big education tech trends that you actually see beyond even what you're doing today, which I think is very innovative and, and smart? What are some of those, those trends you see on the horizon? Well, there's this... There's this um, the, perhaps the biggest trend is this movement towards what's called project-based learning. And project-based learning is um, really focused on accomplishing some some general task. Like we have this we have this mission we want to accomplish, and it, it has a it has a problem statement. Like, hey, our our goal is is to um, you know simulate navigating on the moon. We had a big space challenge because it's the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. And, um, you know, the, the, the project is, is, you know, let's replicate that the path that the astronauts followed while walking on the moon. Um, and so that, that had several phases in which they had to work on it and it required them to bring in different disciplines. So this is the, the primary concept of steam based learning, but it wasn't set like, 
lesson one, lesson two, lesson three that had a straight, um, you know, pedagogy on how you want to progress someone from it. It's more of let the let the child, let the learner um, figure out how to solve these different things in a very collaborative fashion. And I think you're going to see more of that because in the real world, we don't get step one, step two, step three, unless you buy furniture from Ikea uh, and you always want to skip a step. What you get is let's all get in a room and figure this problem out and how are we going to figure it out? And that's what you're going to see is you're going to see how the real world works and being that being brought into the classroom more often where it's not just English or it's not just math class. It's we're going to solve this problem. And in the process of doing that, you're going to learn all these wonderful concepts that are going to advance your, your knowledge. So when you, when you get to taking that test, there's deep understanding of the concepts, not just you figured out how to get an A. That's the biggest trend I see. Paul Roberian, CEO at Sparrow. Great advice and exciting stuff happening in education. If somebody wants to find out more about the work you're doing, or maybe they want to get a cup, they get want to get their own new robot that you had on Kickstarter. How do they do that? Uh, they can go to Sphero.com, uh, S-P-H-E-R-O.com. Sounds good. And if you guys want to find me and more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to TanyaHall.net. Thanks for watching.